Alright, hello everyone. Um, my mic okay? I think it's alright. Alright, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, that was me. Um, my name is Saidi. I'm the Education Coordinator here at the People's Forum. If you haven't been here before, welcome. Um, we're a space for political education or cultural work, and I hope you come back soon. So today I'm really, really, really excited to welcome you all to the fifth seminar of our Science Against Capitalism series, um, where we study biophysical sciences to build a sustainable future for all. This is really important. We've been working on this since la end of last year, um, particularly with the dear help of our comrade Salvatore from Eco Socialist, Eco Socialist Horizons and Communist Nature, Capitalism, Nature, Socialism. Sorry, y'all. Um, this has been a really amazing series to work with, work on, particularly also with the help of Science for the People. We have Vasiki here and Michael here, so I'm really excited for that. And thank you all so much for joining us. And I'm going to pass it over to Salvatore. Thank you very much, Lady. Uh, so, um, as usual, especially for those who are not familiar with this seminar series, uh, we'd just like to remind sort of the main objectives uh, uh, that, um, that motivate um, all of this organizing. Um, and first of all, many thanks to the comrades of the People's Forum uh, for hosting us and for basically being crucial help in even having this happen. And to all of you who are attending, uh, whether online or in person, so the uh, the motivations are basically to get socialists, especially to become more interested um, in becoming scientists in the biophysical or STEM fields. We're going to be switching a little bit here, uh, some um, uh, in terms of uh, the kind of field that is going to be um, uh, represented. Uh, it might veer a little bit from the biophysical sciences. Um, but nevertheless, it is a scientific field that is of uh, utmost significance, as you will see. And the second main motivation is um, to build connections among scientists uh, and beyond, but to have, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, scientists in, in STEM or biophysical sciences in other fields, um, including obviously linguistics, who might be socialists or leaning towards socialism, but don't know, do not know of each other. Um, and so this is one uh, motivation also for having the seminar series, as well as to recruit uh, scientists to socialist causes, um, because uh, when uh, hopefully a major change will come, uh, whether in this country or not, uh, there goes there's going to be a need for uh, people with a lot of technical expertise to make things uh, click. So um, all the more important to have them on the side of socialism rather than otherwise and if possible for those of you who are interested is, uh, in, in these kinds of uh, objectives to organize as well yourselves seminars of this sort uh, and to keep in touch with uh, us here um, to uh, build even more connections even more networks um, uh, to spread the um, this kind of endeavor uh, as far and wide as possible at least on this part of the world um, with that said, um, I would like to thank very much Science for the People, who are really the force uh, behind uh, this uh, seminar in particular, but have, al have also been involved um, basically from the start as well, in one way or another. And uh, um, so this is also a chance for uh, those who are uh, interested in biophysical sciences to get acquainted um, and those who are not necessarily well, to get acquainted a little bit more with science for the people and also with a field that is also beyond my expertise, um, linguistics in general and computational linguistics at that. So Vasiki, thank you very much for all the work you've been doing and I will I allow you to introduce uh, Professor Gasser, Gasser uh, rather than I. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here and a lot of you might know me as just a participant in many of the study groups that we've had in the other sessions within the series that we've done within Science versus Capitalism about the biophysical sciences. So I'm really happy to be here and feature an active Science for the People member for this session. Um, I think for any practitioner of science, the rupture between the positivist attitude that we need to take in order to do our work and the 
alienation we feel in our workplace with the values we have as socialists and as scientists who care about social justice is very tangible and real. So I was looking for a community like the one that the People's Forum has created through this education series. So Science for the Fe People is very excited to take this challenge on and bring our members and other experts who um, are adjacent in our political beliefs to this series. And um, over the course of this series, I've also had a lot of interactions where people have asked about the best ways to get involved. Um, please stay in communication. If you join the study group, there's a WhatsApp, which is a really good way to share resources. And all of us are always available to talk a little bit more about what we do and how you can get involved, either locally, wherever you're active and where you live, or um, in a more distributed fashion um, with the publication of Science for the People. So with that context, I'm really, really happy to introduce Michael Gasser today. Michael is a computational linguist working on language technology for languages with few digital resources, especially from the Horn of Africa, and an activist working on environmental justice and anti-imperialism. He retired from academia in 2012 after 24 years in the informatics and cognitive science programs in the Indiana University. He's a member of Democratic Socialists of America and Science for the People, where he has been involved in the anti-militarism and translation working groups and on the editorial collective for several issues of the magazine. And this is coming from Michael to say he's been involved with the translation working group is really understating it. He is the resource we go to when we want to live by the values that we say Science for the People has and make our writing accessible in a multitude of languages that people want to see it written in. So thanks for everything that you do for Science for the People. Um, it's really exciting to have a personal connection featured in this uh, series, and I can't wait to see how this all evolves. But for those of you who might be hearing about Science for the People for the first time, I want to share a little bit about what this organization is as well. Thanks to Calvin, our secretary, for coming up with this language. So Science for the People, the most important radical science movement in the US history, arose in 1969 out of the anti-war movement and lasted till 1989. With a Marxist analysis and non-hierarchical governing structure, Science for the People tackled, among many issues, militarization of scientific research, corporate con control of research agenda, political implications of sociobiology -bio and other scientific theories, environmental consequences of energy policy, inequities in healthcare, etc. Its members opposed, historically, racism, sexism, and classism in science, and above all, sought to mobilize people working in scientific fields to become active in agitating for science, technology, and medicine that would serve social needs. Through research, writing, protest, and grassroots organizing, Science for the People sought to demystify scientific knowledge and embolden the people to take science and technology into their own hands. SFTP's numerous publications played a formative role in the field of science and technology studies, challenging mainstream understandings of science as neutral and instead showing it to be inherently political. So with that, um, that's what we do. I'm going to pass it on to Michael Gasser to tell us a little bit more about how we actually do it. How we do it? We do it in, oh well first, it's great to be here. Um, so, I mean, in this space, which is an amazing space. It's also great to be in New York City, but <laughs> um, I just flew in from California yesterday, so it's been 10 years, I think. Uh, so, how do we do it? We do it in uh, working groups like anti-militarism and the publication working group and uh, we've had over, uh, off and on a, an environmental working group and uh, we have uh, anti-racism subgroups and we do it in chapters that are, that, that, that sort of, sort of fluctuate. <laughs> they, they live and thrive for years and then the key people leave and another chapter somewhere else pops up. But there are always around, I would say, 10 active chapters. Now they, they actually uh, exist on, uh, I think, four continents, um, right? If you count Thailand and South Africa and uh, uh, the UK. So uh, we do it on Zoom mostly. 
but uh, locally we do it as well. And um, the chapter here is about to revive itself, right? Right after this meeting. That's <laughs> <laughs> one of the goals of this is to bring together, bring New York together again, right? So. Fantastic, yeah. No, it, I'm not, I really hope it's going to be revived. Uh, I certainly would benefit myself being not exactly local, but um, I'm sure that that would be something that will be of advantage for even people in the lower uh, to mid Hudson Valley, I should think. Um, in any case, uh, being a layperson to linguistics, even though I kind of dabbled it as an early teen and then never got to anything uh, consequential. Uh, so I find your work particularly intriguing for that reason alone with that background. But could you give those of us who are not familiar an overview of computational linguistics in particular, uh, I guess it's, uh, as you've educated me about how it's also known as natural language processing and human language technology. So to give an overview of, of, of that as a field of study, how it's related to linguistics and to artificial intelligence. Uh, then what is it? What does it address and how? What's the significance of that kind of work? In, especially in this conjuncture. Yeah, let me first say, um, this is a strange setting for me. It sort of looks like a class, but also feels like a talk. So <laughs> I'd ra have it, rather have it be more like a class. So <laughs> just yeah. interrupt whenever you feel like it, and that goes for uh, Zoom people as well. Um, so I, I, I would like to have a chance to say something about what the field is. I may be telling you things that you already know. And also something about what's wrong with it and what's wrong with the world that it engages with. And then hopefully, um, in this case, it doesn't happen with all of the sciences, I think, tell you ways that I think uh, science for good can actually happen within this field and to some extent already is. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that in inspires people who might want to leave the field because of their politics to stay and do something within the field. So I, I have some slides, quite a lot of slides here, let's see. And, and I have put some empty slides in the middle along the way to remind myself to stop and um, <laughs> uh, give you a chance <laughs> to speak. So, um, so I, I l when I uh, teach classes in this, I, when I teach, seems to be going, yeah, flickering. Is that Why would that be? Is that me? Is that Zoom? I'm not seeing it on my screen, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wait, you gotta yeah, get out of here. Possibly the pictographic memory will have an advantage. Uh, now we know the refresh rate of the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> They're flickering. Let's see if maybe it's Someone when I play it. it. Oh. Hmm, has something to do with playing. That doesn't make much sense. Hmm. hmm. Could be. Why would? It, yeah. Could be. Although I haven't had that trouble on Zoom before. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Or save it as a <laughs> PDF and then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, give me give me a minute then. Okay. So. So do some you know, some <laughs> something sure. entertaining. Extemporating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, bring out the uh, cocktails and all that. Oh, that will be afterwards. Sorry. <laughs> Well, if we do get a chance to talk about how to keep people who are linguists, who might have a socialist leaning to, you know, t t to be kept within the field rather than escape to, uh, to others, I hope we can get to that as well. Especially those of us here who might be in that struggle, you might want to relate to the rest of us how, they, how you deal with it.
There we are. Brilliant. Is that okay? I mean, it's full screen for me, but not for you, so. Looks fine. But no, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Oh, I guess it doesn't look fine. <laughs> oh, okay. And now share it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so when I teach classes um, to computer science students, the ones that I usually teach classes to, I like to start with, uh, with what language is, because language is viewed differently by different language sciences, and there are about eight language sciences. Language is studied by people that come from all sorts of different perspectives. So one way to look at languages is the way linguists do, as a series of conventions. And linguists worry about how you can describe those conventions in systematic ways. And what can we, cons what can we say about how languages structure, pronunciation, words, word meanings, and grammar. Another way to look at language is, is as something that happens in the mind or the brain, and focus on processing language, how we learn it, how we understand it and how we produce it. And that's the perspective of cognitive science, in particular psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics. Um, another way to look at uh, a language like English is all the sentences of English that anybody has ever produced in the history of English. Or uh, an approximation of that, like the people at OpenAI believe that they have approximated English by gathering all the sentences from the Open Corpus Project. Unfortunately, as we'll see later, they haven't actually approximated English in that way. But for people like that, in computational linguistics, English is just all the sentences of English. Maybe or maybe not in context. Mm. Without talking about how they're structured or what they mean. Another way to look at a language like English is as, is as a way of communicating between people. And that's the focus of social linguistics, which is close to sociology. And finally, uh, uh, you could look at it ling linguistics from language from a cultural perspective, which is what anthropological linguists do, who worry about how language is, uh, each language is a way of, of looking at the world, of dividing up the world into categories. So the field that, that I'm going to be talking about has different names. It's usually called NLP, natural language processing. Some people call it computational linguistics, and some people call it human language technology. It's best seen as a subfield of AI, not seen as a subfield of linguistics, especially nowadays. So nowadays, the, it has more in common with other kinds, other things that go on in AI, in particular with machine learning and with computer vision, than it does with it goes, what goes on in linguistics, for better or worse. Uh, there's, there's been historically some overlap with people who try to understand how humans process language. For the most part, natural language processing can be seen as engineering. And when it's theoretical, it's about how to design systems that work, not how to design systems that model human beings. But historically, there has been a, a some, somewhat overlap with people who wanted to understand, using computers like I used to do, how we human beings process language. So language technology is everywhere. And it, it starts with aspects of using computers with language that we don't think of really as natural language processing because they're so basic. It starts with keyboards, with keyboard layouts, which are a way to map a writing system onto keystrokes. Different writing systems are mapped onto keyboards in different ways, and some writing systems aren't yet mapped handily onto keyboards. It, it starts with fonts. It starts with localization, which means having all the menus and all the items that you expect to have, for example, in your browser, in your in your home language rather than in some foreign language, which is usually English for most of the world. So when we talk about computational linguistics, we talk about things that are a bit more complicated, um, starting with, with things as simple and as universal and common as spell checking or grammar checking or even auto-completion when you're typing text on your phone and your phone knows what the next word is probably going to be. Uh, a little bit more complex is uh, automatic speech recognition or automatic sign recognition. When we're talking about sign languages, those are systems that understand what somebody is saying or what somebody is signing. 
Information retrieval more and more involves actually natural language processing, not just looking for keywords, but for trying to figure out what you really are after when you ask a question, rather than just looking for the words in the question and finding documents that contain those words. Sometimes we want to ask uh, computers to do something as complicated as make an inference. That involves uh, natural language processing. Sentiment analysis means taking a text and trying to figure out if the person who wrote the text was being positive or being negative. Is this a positive review of a movie? If it's a positive review of a product or movie, is it sort of uh, extremely positive or not so much? Did they like the uh, lens of the camera, but they didn't like the way uh, the focus of the camera? All of that is uh, something that companies pay enormous amounts of money for natural language processing people to do for them. Uh, for example, there's a huge AI group at uh, Netflix that tries to figure out w what, what people uh, are saying when they comment on movies. Um, sentiment analysis overlaps a bit with document classification, which is to try and figure out what documents are about. That involves some understanding of what the document is saying, not just looking for the keywords, but sometimes how they're related to each other. A uh, related area is hate, spe hate speech detection, which is supposed to be happening all the time on uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, for example, but isn't always happening, uh, especially for languages that don't have the resources that we need to do that. So th there we're looking for keywords, but we may also be looking for the relationships between words that de to determine whether something is hate speech. Language documentation means assembling information about languages that may be endangered, where we need, to, we, we need to know more about them, and we'd like technology to help us in that process. So the other end of language is not analyzing it, it's producing it, and NLP is involved there as well. We want to be able not only to understand speech, to know what people are saying, but to produce speech. So when you talk to your phone and your phone talks back to you, it's doing speech synthesis. We want to be able to do this for sign languages as well. So there's sign th synthesis, where uh, technology is actually synthesizing signing in an in a avatar on the screen. Text summarization means trying to uh, write a text that summarizes the content of, for example, an ac academic paper. Question answering means taking a question from a user and responding in, a, in an intelligible way. Intelligent assistants and conversational agents work with people in different domains, like health, the health domain, for example. Uh, AI is involved in natural language processing, is involved in teaching, when, when technology is, is a part of education, in particular in language instruction. Machine translation is kind of the pinnacle of all this, sort of the holy grail, because it's such a hard task. It involves both some kind of understanding or processing of the source language and some kind of production or generation of the target language. And finally, I put the little emoji at the end there because these are, these are things that now, as you probably know, technology is beginning to do but uh, probably shouldn't be doing or maybe shouldn't be doing and it's something uh, that, I'll, that I'll be talking about later because we now have technology that can at least pretend to do things like uh, take tests or write short stories or even screenplays, I understand now they're talking about. So I'll, I'll come back to uh, GPT and, and, and what that means later. Um, so, so how does this work? How do these systems work? Well, I'll just give you a kind of overview because uh, a big change happened around 15, 20 years ago from, a, from the old kind of computational linguistics, which really did deservedly get called computational linguistics because it was that. The uh, people wrote systems that had rules. People wrote symbolic systems. They worked with text, and text is easy to think of a series of symbols. They worked with people who studied languages and wrote rules that described the syntax and the morphology and the pronunciation of languages. They worked with systems that used logic as well, rules from logic. The rules were explicit in the systems, you, so you knew how they worked. You could go inside them and say, oh, here's a rule, and th this didn't work because this rule needed to be tweaked in certain ways. They didn't work very well. So not, not these systems weren't pervasive like they are today. You didn't see them everywhere, right? In particular, they didn't work for things like speech. And so if you remember, if you're old enough to remember, speech technology was terrible. Uh, as of 20 years ago, on both ends, both the recognition end and on the synthesis end. It was embarrassingly bad, right? Um, and so these systems were very brittle, 
and they required expertise. They required experts to write the rules for languages. And the problem was that nobody really knew what all the rules were. Even the most studied language in human history, English, people are still arguing about what the actual rules are for a lot of the little subparts of English. So uh, what happened at the beginning of the 20th century was uh, technology advanced and um, data advanced. So suddenly there were massive amounts of data in English and a few other languages and suddenly the machines were able to work much more quickly, right? So computing power increased and data increased and now we see the advent of machine learning systems that don't uh, normally have any linguistic rules at all. What they have is massive amounts of data and a training. These are usually nowadays, uh, this, trend, this trend started with speech. So the speech people early on realized they couldn't do what they were doing because they weren't working with symbols. They weren't working with, with words, with characters. They were working with raw acoustic data that would come in. And there was no way they could just chop it up into little segments and figure out where the words were using what linguists told them. <laughs> so one, one, um, one joke at the time was one of the, one of the companies that developed these systems said, every time I fire a linguist, the performance of my system goes up by five points. <laughs> so um, that could be said, actually, as a kind of summary for what happened in the, in the field beyond speech at the beginning of the 20th century when a machine learning began to take over. And so, so we see the advent of neural networks, which had been around a long time. I used to work with neural networks in cognitive science, but they were there for theoretical reasons. Nobody ever imagined that they'd have some kind of practical applications that people would be building real systems that people would use, let alone that would write screenplays in uh, the 21st century. So these systems have drawbacks as well. They require a lot of data, which I'll come back to that later, because there's a lot of data for English, but there isn't a lot of data for Zulu. Um, there are actually insights from linguistics. Linguists do know some things, and uh, these systems don't have any of that knowledge. And, and maybe worst of all, we don't really know how they work. I mean, we know how they work in the sense of how the system works. The system is designed to do a certain thing, but we don't really know where the knowledge is inside or even what knowledge is in there. All you can say is they've been trained on this data when companies like OpenAI will tell you. Usually they won't. But if they would tell you and you knew what data they were trained on, you still don't know what they know. And so they're, hard to under they're very hard to understand, which is potentially um, dangerous, actually. So here's a, a, a little quick kind of caricature of the, the, the change that happened uh, when the 21st century began. So let's say we wanted to build a rule-based machine translation system. We would input an English sentence like that and do some analysis of it and then convert, it, convert some of the expressions that, that have to be converted in particular ways like this idiom to the Spanish idiom and then map the words using a dictionary and the structure and come up with a Spanish sentence using basically a set of rules and a bilingual dictionary. So in neural machine translation, we start with a big neural network, which is a system that's originally modeled on roughly the way the brain works, where you have lots of, of connections that correspond to synapses, and, but really are just parameters in the system. And these systems now are enormous. Uh, GPT-3 has uh, more than 100 billion parameters in it, and no one knows, but uh, people imagine that GPT-4 has already a trillion. And so you build this system where these uh, parameters start usually with random values, and then you, then you present data to them. In the case of machine translation, you present pairs of source language and target language sentences, and you present lots of them, like <laughs> really, really lots of them. <laughs> and, um, and in response to these sentences, the weights change, right? The weights adapt themselves, the parameters ad adapt themselves to the data, and you finally have a system that you can then test by presenting it with an English sentence and hopefully get a Span uh, Spanish sentence out. Of course, it's more complicated than that. You have to figure out ways to convert words in sentences to numbers because neural networks just work with numbers. They don't work with symbols, and that's been what the field has focused on, as well as architectures that are yeah, a little more complicated than this picture, but in the end, really not 
that complicated. There's no grammar in the architectures. There's no dictionary in the architectures. There are really just modules of little units that are connected to other modules by connections that don't know what they're there for until the system is trained. So why does it matter? The, the, the last question. Um, these, these are everywhere. They're in the systems that we use and they're also in the systems that companies are paying uh, people money uh, to build for us. They're also a part of the, the new kind of uh, scary applications that we're seeing now. They, these are basically NLP. Um, so the things that we need to think about from the Science for the People perspective that I'll come back to are who gets to decide what applications are made and how they're made. So who's making these decisions? Obviously, we are not. Um, Google is, OpenAI is, Microsoft is. So they're deciding what to build and how to build it. And then we need to ask who benefits from the systems that are built, who is harmed by the systems that are built or potentially harmed, and, and finally, who's left out of this picture entirely? Who is not being served, hurt or helped, not being served at all by the technology? So there's a, a blank slide. So why don't, why don't we stop and see if people have any questions so far. And oh, there's an infinite regress That's there. That's fantastic, <laughs> yeah, it's great. Oh, damn. Well, I mean, you, you really are uh, touching on some inherently political aspects yeah, of, of contextual sure. linguistics. So in perhaps to draw those out a little bit more, since you already started, those three questions seem to me to, to be very political questions immediately, you know, who's excluded and who decides over what. Uh, and in your view, what drives um, in the mainstream or, or the capitalist research, or the capitalist funded research I mean, that you already mentioned, in computational linguistics, what what what's um, what is the main driving um, factor, I suppose, or set of factors, and then what do you see as encouraging trends in the field um, in terms of addressing social justice and could be useful towards overcoming capitalism, building socialism, if you like. Given the, the essential questions yeah. already, like sort of start in our direction there, I think, but just to draw them out a bit. Unless there are, yeah, yeah. Any other questions, sir? Uh, yeah, Calvin. Mm. Yeah. So Thank you. So um, I have a more technical question, so maybe we can discuss a little bit before we get into the political questions. Um, so I do AI for image analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of trying to figure out, like, you know, identify images, you know, f like features in the images. And in deep learning or neural networks, you don't know what's being extracted in, in terms of the features, right? Right. Um, but there are people who are trying to build a network that has interpretable layers that yeah. that human can actually try to figure out. Okay, what are the machine actually seeing in in, a cla in classification? Um, is is that possible for language models, or are there yeah. any attempts to do that? Yeah, there is a trend in in AI generally that this is part of that you know of. I'm I'm sure called explainable AI, where. Uh, I it's interesting because n no one needed a, an area like that <laughs> in the old days when the systems were easy to understand, but now it, it's quite scary to, to not know what they do. And so there is this field called explainable AI, and there are people trying to understand these language systems by going in and, and probing. I, I mean, I have a student of my own who is really interested in doing that. Uh, and, and using, you can use now linguistics, right? You can go in and say, well, how much grammar does this thing actually know? Because the systems have to, given what they're doing, they have to intuitively be learning something about the grammar of a language like English. But where is it? And what words are actually in there? What, and what relationships between words are in there? So, yeah, they're working on systems where they're, they're, they're going to go in and try to build a separate network, as you said, that tries to figure out what's going on inside the guts of one of these systems. So that's a, an, an encouraging trend, I would say. Yeah. So um, to get, before I get actually to um, encouraging, more about encouraging trends, I want to say more about what's wrong. And um, first, a, a bit about how language is political in, in ways that I might not have emphasized so far. And that is that um, obviously language is political. Uh, 
because everything political is expressed in language for the most part. And but, but the way that I want to emphasize is the role of language as uh, a conduit to knowledge. So we get most of our knowledge through language. And you can only get it if you have, have access to the, the code that you understand. So you get it through a language that you know. And um, knowing particular languages means having power in the, in the history of knowledge and power. And knowing particular other languages or dialects means being stigmatized because of who those dialects are associated with and because you're denied access to knowledge given those. Uh, and, and I'm also going to, when I talk about technology, I want to go way back and, and talk about writing because writing is technology and printing is technology and what that meant for these gaps between the haves and the have-nots in terms of knowledge. Those with access to writing had more access, those without that access had less access. So access to language technology is is also, of course, ultimately inherently political. So language is um, is can be seen as a way of codifying knowledge in the form of information, right? And language can be seen as a way of sharing knowledge in the form of encoded information. And language can be seen as crucial for knowledge creation, especially collaborative knowledge creation. When we have multiple languages, though, we have the potential of gaps and, uh, and failure to communicate between groups. So we can have collaboration within li a language or dialect, collaboration with an in another, but we actually need the, the special uh, character in human history, one of the most important figures in human history, the translator, that intervenes to make it possible for these two groups to uh, collaborate with each other, right? So the translator comes in, has access to two languages, and enables the, the collaboration across languages. So I think I'll skip this and uh, just, just mention this. So I'm going to be talking about what, what I call, and a few other people call, the democratization of knowledge, which is the process by which more and more people have access to knowledge and how that's related to have access to knowledge and, and have the tools available to, the, uh, to them to collaborate in the creation of knowledge, sharing knowledge, the, the ability to share knowledge among more and more people and how that's related to language through history and language technology. So uh, what does it mean that we have multiple languages first? So we need to kind of get out of the way the question of whether that's a bad thing or a good thing because there, are, there often are audiences where people will stand up and say, well, languages are dying and isn't that what we need? Well, I'm going to take, take the stance that's a common one among people who study language from different perspectives that it's actually a good thing that we have multiple languages. To some extent, in the same sense, it's a good thing that we have diversity within biology because diversity means we have multiple options to choose from. That's especially true if you believe that each language is a kind of window on reality, that a language is a way of slicing up in discrete categories, whether those are lexical word categories or grammatical categories, a world that is not discrete, a world that is continuous and, and infinite in a sense. So each time uh, a language does that, we, we have access to a different way of seeing the world, and when we lose that language, it's not just a, a, a horrible disaster for the community of people who speak it, it is for all of us. Not just for linguists who love languages for their own sake, but potentially for the future of humanity even. We, l we lose the potential to think in a different way. So I'm going to take the stance here that language diversity is a good thing. But language diversity does allow for exclusion. And so if we start going back to the beginning of class, which has sometimes like by Engels, been argued, started with agriculture, uh, we, we have the beginnings of exclusion on the basis of language and dialect as well. So certain languages are privileged over others, typically those spoken by those in the capital, those spoken, spoken by, the, by the noble people, and other languages are excluded and marginalized and replaced. And so if you if you read The Dawn of Everything, which y you can be critical of in a number of different ways, but there are a lot of insights in The Dawn of Everything. One, one interesting uh, proposal is that social control has three bases. One of those is control of information. So that's really what this is about, right? To stay in power, you, c you keep your access to information, you deny it to others, and that happens very often through language. 
So I guess I'll, uh, I'll go ahead a bit. And so what happens with writing? What happens with writing is that the encoding that you, you make when you create information now persists. It doesn't vanish in thin air so that you have to hold it in your memory. It now appears on paper. And so this seems like it would have led to the increase in like the democratization of knowledge. But not really, because literacy is available only to a very small number of people, and literacy is only possible in a very small number of languages. And we can see how literacy is related to power and knowledge if we look at the way that literacy was illegal to slaves in pre-Civil War United States. So it was illegal in, in some of the southern states to teach slaves to read and write. So the, the connection to power and to the threat of rebellion seems especially clear in that kind of context, right? So then we have printing, which is another advance, another technological advance that's, that had the potential to lead to massive democratization of knowledge, but didn't really because it was still available to only a small number of people. We did, though, what it did, do, though, mean was the beginning of search. So for the first time, search in the modern sense was now possible with libraries. Libraries were the beginning of real serious sophisticated search which we now take for granted today, right? So what happens with nation states in the 19th century is that literacy now becomes something that the, that the state wants to spread to the population because literacy is the, is the means that they will then use to indoctrinate the population to, to foster unity and to get them to serve the nation in foreign wars and so on, right? But because of, because of the need to foster unity, they're also going to foster national languages at the expense of all the others. So France is a multilingual country where around 20 languages were spoken, but all of them are now endangered except French because of this policy. Japan is a multilingual country where around 10 languages were spoken. All of them are almost extinct except Japanese because of this policy. So the nation state led to the marginalization of these non-standard languages, uh, a kind of suppression, and the standardization of national languages. So how does that then, then map onto colonialism? The first aspect of colonialism that's relevant for this is the settler colonial projects in places like North America and Australia and New Zealand, where the goal was basically to eliminate populations, right? We're talking about genocide, serious genocide, but then we have those that, that managed to survive the physical genocide. They were then subjected to these assimilation policies, which were really linguicide, uh, as it's called sometimes. The goal was to destroy all the remaining languages that managed to survive. So now we have the residential schools in um, Canada and the United States where, where, where children were forbidden to speak their languages. Probably the, the most devastating single period in the history of American languages was the early 20th century in the residential schools. It was, it was really fatal for a number of languages and close to fatal for, for most others. Not just for languages. If you believe Gerald Roche, um, linguicide is actually genocide. And in a, in, a, in a real physical way. I mean, he, he makes the argument that, that, the, that, the, that the destruction of your language and, and the culture that goes along with it is actually physically harmful to people, actually leads to, to death. And so we're talking about a real serious crime here, right? So the, re the result of this is the death of most of the languages of North America and of Australia. And, but, I, but I should emphasize, and it's important to emphasize this, that there is a survival process uh, that people did survive this process, and they're, and they're involved in a real, what I would call massive uh, effort to revitalize languages, and even bring back languages that haven't been spoken for, in some cases, almost 100 years. Um, so imperialism, the other side of imperialism, the projects that were not really settler colonial projects uh, in Africa and India and so on, um, of course, also involved language. And I really like the, the quote from the, the great Kenyan novelist Ngogiwa Thiongo, who, who has very strong opinions about language, actually decided at some point in his career, he was already an established in a novelist in English, decided to stop writing his novels in English and to begin writing them in Kikuyu, his native language, and then to translate them into English. Um, because, of, because of this legacy that he, that he felt, uh, he said in Colonial Conquest, language did to the mind what the sword did to the bodies of the colonized. So what happened, as you are probably 
aware was that colonizing countries imposed their languages on the populations. These became the languages of education and for the most part of administration. When they needed local languages, they would, they would pick one typically and then suppress all the others. And so what this led to was a kind of sometimes conscious uh, competition between the, the languages that were spoken by the populations. So this pr uh, produced divisions, serious divisions, between the privileged local people who were able to learn the foreign European languages and the others who weren't. Divisions that were then perpetuated later on, right? The, the other um, really harmful uh, effect of all of this was the boundaries that separated uh, the divided ethnic groups, right, down the middle. I mean, most in the most extreme case, I think the Afar people, uh, there, there are several million Afars, are now divided between three nations, between Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Djibouti, because of this process of dividing boundaries in a way that actually would divide people so that they didn't pr present this kind of threat. So what you're left with after uh, colonialism, with independence, is nations that are faced with uh, the task of coming up with national languages. I mean, uh, they really had no choice in many cases but to adopt the European languages as the national languages. Um, in a few cases, they were able to avoid it where there were very strong local languages in, in, a, ca in a country like uh, Rwanda or Somalia. But um, because of the way the boundaries had been drawn, the way countries had been combined, and all the suppression of local languages, we ended up with, in particular, Africa, where English, French, and Portuguese are the national languages of most of the countries. And the result, and uh, this, this began in uh, Latin America, when the Latin American countries became independent in the early 19th century with Spanish and Portuguese. So you have today in Guatemala, uh, almost half of the population speaking as native languages, indigenous languages that get no support at all from the state, uh, absolutely none, are completely suppressed, but manage to survive as native languages. And then you have a country like Angola, which has 46 languages. Um, and here we are, what, 50 years after independence, and now 71% of the population speaks a uh, European language as their home language. So you have many, many Africans in countries like Gabon and uh, Angola who no longer speak African languages. Um, this is <laughs> you know, that, that's the legacy of colonialism for, for language in Africa in particular. But it, it's really useful to point out exceptions to this process. I'll pick two exceptions that are kind of favorites of mine. Ethiopia, the place, place I know best that has a very progressive language policy, partly because they really weren't colonized. Uh, they've been lucky in some other ways. But in Ethiopia, of, of the 90 to 100 languages, almost half are now used in education. Uh, around 50 languages are used in education. That's encouraged by the state. Vietnam, because of its socialist history, also has a very different kind of language policy. Having gone through French colonialism and uh, the French efforts to suppress the Vietnamese language, um, Vietnamese is spoken by about 85% of the population as the native language, but they have um, many other minority languages. And the official policy is to support as far as possible all of those minority languages in education. So there are many forward-thinking projects to make even very small languages taught in the schools and to, to have them be written and have ch children learn li literacy in those languages. So um, a bit more and then I'll... Um, so I, I haven't gotten to the, the digital revolution yet, but I'm leading up to it. But I want to I want to uh, say one more thing before I before I go into that about where we were at the beginning of the digital revolution with respect to what you can think of as a kind of linguistic content divide in terms of how much information was available in different languages in the world. And you can kind of look at this. I tried to estimate it by looking at the books published in different uh, countries. So if we look at recent data on this, and we look at books published in Anglophone countries, that's United States, Canada, UK, Australia, um, we find uh, 490,000 books per year. That's English. Then we take Arab countries. There are, what, around 20 Arab countries. That's a very large population. In the, and we have 34,000 books for that major language, Arab being one of the major world languages. 
if we take Vietnam, a country uh, with a language that's spoken by 80 million people, uh, we have uh, still, I mean, this is relatively successful. Vietnam is one of the most successful places that I'm going to be talking about, mm -hmm. 25,000. And if we take India and if we subtract the books published in English and Hindi, we have 45,000 books for all, basically all uh, 12 of the other major languages of India. Divide that by 12, the other languages that are official state languages. So, so that shows, uh, gives you an idea of the, the gap in content in terms of what, what's written in different languages. But then we can look at libraries. Um, so we look at public libraries per 10,000 people. It, it happens that Ukraine is the highest in the world. Um, and so we, we, we see the, the socialist countries, uh, the former socialist countries, uh, scoring really high on, the, on, these, uh, on this measure. San Marino, a uh, small country within Italy, Russia, Poland, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, uh, surprisingly, and Italy are the highest. Then there's a, a kind of countries in the middle include Vietnam, Uruguay, Cuba, and the U.S. And then at the bottom we have countries where there are in entire countries maybe two public libraries, like in Kenya or Nigeria. Um, and so if, if a library is another measure of access to knowledge, access to information, there's a huge gap separating countries in the world. So finally, to kind of summarize where we were at the dawn of the digital age, when things took off and things did change, a small number, we have a small number of colonial European languages dominating the world, both in terms of how much they're used and in terms of what's available in them. And then we have a few other state-sanctioned European languages, languages like Hungarian or, or um, uh, Serbo-Croatian or Swedish that are doing pretty well. And we have a few Asian languages that are also doing well, like Chinese and Japanese. And then we have some colonized languages that received minimal support, which are not doing so well, but they still have speakers. Those are languages like Swahili or Hausa or Urdu. And then we have the vast majority of the world's languages, which uh, are extremely marginalized, uh, marginalized and all really under threat of extinction by the end of the, end of the century. So in, in summary, we have this huge gap bet uh, between languages that have knowledge available in them, that people have, where people have access to knowledge, and a lot of other languages that where not only do they not have access to the knowledge in them, but those languages themselves and the cultures and the community of people that speak them aren't going to maybe survive this, this century. So why don't I stop there? And uh, I haven't gotten to what's potentially good because I'm still talking about what's wrong mm -hmm. and have a bit more to say about that in the digital age, but I think it's, it's good to uh, give people a chance to ask some questions. Are there any questions as well online? More regarded to AI, um, so we could ask it now and you can answer it later if you'd like. Ready to go? Go back. Um, if one of these neural net AIs was developed instead publicly by an open source and public institution slash open development, how might this alter the impact slash benefit slash social relevance compared with private? Compared with what? I mean, having the fact that this was developed, that this is open source as opposed to... If it were, yes, if it were to be developed openly as opposed to being developed privately. Uh-huh. Maybe I can talk about that when we uh, come, come to neural network systems later, but it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Heidi. Uh, super interesting. Uh, this is kind of more of a general question, but uh, uh, why is it that when you get older, uh, it becomes so much more <laughs> difficult for you to learn another language? Yeah. And, and why do some people just get it so much more quickly than other people? Um, well, that no one really knows. <laughs> there are different theories about it, but um, children seem to be roughly 
equal uh, in ability when they're learning their first language or multiple languages. Children have the capacity to learn. No one knows, you know, what the limit is. Multiple languages simultaneously with just a little delay over fewer. Um, but that changes later. And there are different ideas about why it changes. Brain plasticity is the most commonly uh, thought of one. But there are other, there are other factors that intervene, like um, inhibition. Uh, Children, when they're learning their, their first language, don't suffer from the same inhibition that we suffer after a certain age. And, um, and so we, we, we're not as likely to just be willing to make mistakes and, and practice in the same way that, that children do. Um, but, but brain plasticity is probably the, the best explanation for it. We just get rigid, right? And <laughs> so, uh, there also are a, a lot uh, bigger individual differences in second lang language learning uh, for reasons that I, I don't think are well understood than, there, than in first language learning, there f for whatever reasons. Yeah. Could have to do with motivation even. A lot of this has to do with motivation, which doesn't distinguish, you know, infants from each other. They all have the same <laughs> drive to <laughs> figure out what is going on around them, right? <laughs> Whereas people have very different reasons for learning second, third, fourth languages, right? Yes. So I just wanted to clarify because I think I read and that you said that all, uh, most languages will be extinct by the end of this century. And I'm curious what you think of, okay, I guess I'm misunderstanding. Most that. are endangered, let's say. Okay, yeah. and then for, l f so I'm thinking of like Urdu and Hindi and yeah. Persian, where there are hundreds of millions of yeah. speakers. How do you judge whether a language is endangered or extinct? Uh -huh. And h what relation does that have to access to? I feel like there's a connection maybe that's being made between like endangerment and the existence of libraries and print texts and access to education and literacy in that language. So just, yeah. Yeah, I, I skipped a slide that I, that I maybe shouldn't have skipped, which is about the different um, environments that languages are used in. So languages are used in the home, or they're used in the marketplace, or they're used in school, or they're used in administration, or in business. And um, the people who study endangerment, I'm not one of those people, um, uh, social linguists look at environments that languages are used in and, and really treat a language as endangered when they begin to see children not learning it at home, so the language not being taught to children. That's when we know that a language is really endangered. The idea is that potentially by the end of the t uh, this century, potentially half the world's languages may be endangered. Half may, may die out. Those are numbers that people say. The United Nations says a language dies, I think, every three weeks. That's a UNESCO estimate and so on. But, but uh, H Hindi and Urdu will survive. The <laughs> Hindi is the, the second or third, third or fourth most spoken language in the world. And so th those languages will survive uh, for sure. But m what I want to emphasize uh, in the next part is the role that technology could play in helping languages to stay strong or marginalizing, making them even more marginal than they are because of the role that technology plays now. Right. So if, you, if your language is excluded from technology for whatever reason, then that's a whole side of life that almost didn't exist before where your language doesn't exist. So the, the, the world that it does exist in, pro mainly the home in, in many cases, is all that's, that's left. You know. The home when you put your device down right, at dinner, when you put the device down that now every, just about everybody has. <laughs> right. It is kind of becoming universal, and so I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. So shall I go on? I don't know. I'm still in kind of answering that question. I think uh, so. Well, then I would, I would suggest com continuing with okay. that thought. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. what I really want to um, talk about is the uh, the linguistic digital divide, which is related to the divide that I already talked about. Uh, which was this kind of content divide that separated languages from other languages. Um, and so let's first think about the digital revolution and what it meant for knowledge. We can think of this after language, uh, literacy, writing, right, and printing as now this fourth revolution in the history of human knowledge spreading. And so obviously this was a really important revolution because it meant that knowledge became accessible, far more accessible for written languages. It meant that copying 
became finally really unnecessary, copying in the old sense of printing. It meant that we now had search engines where we could search incredible amounts of, uh, of databases that were unheard of before. And it also means that there are new possibilities for knowledge creation and collaboration because of technology that allows us to, to do things like we're doing now with Zoom. Um, so there, was, there were really were the dreamers at this time, not naive dreamers, who thought, well, could this actually bridge the, the, the old gap that separated languages from each other? Could we now have NLP that helped us overcome these gaps that had existed through the history of, uh, since the beginning of class, that divided speakers of some languages from others? Um, and could we use this to revitalize endangered languages? And in other words, support the democratization of knowledge. And this, this goal, again, extremely naively, has, has become part of United Nations dogma. And so here's some, here's some text from the resolution that they passed at the end of 2015. Uh, the, the resolution is the need for further development of local content and services in a variety of languages and formats that are accessible to all people. The vital importance of the principles of multilingualism in the information society to ensure the linguistic, cultural, and historic diversity of all nations. And there, UNESCO has a, has a series of meetings that happen every few years, the World Summit on Information Society, which has come up with these principles that are very bold and uh, actually, it turns out, very unrealistic in given the, the world we're, we're in. So let's talk about, about how we're not there yet. So here's a picture of, of language diversity in the world. Not just first language speakers, but you know, being a little bit more cautious, let's, let's include first and second language speakers. Chinese is still the most spoken language if we include both first and second language speakers. Um, and now all the other languages beyond these 10 make up a little less than half of the world. So we have, you know, more than half of the people in the world speaking as a first or second language, one of those uh, 10. And so um, now let's look at um, measures of Internet content. And I should say uh, the total Internet content in a language is very hard to measure. And there are competing measures that disagree quite radically. So I, I just decided to average them together. So this green bar is a measure of the amount of content on, uh, on the Internet that's in a given language. And so the, the relative length of the bars tells you kind of how well a language is doing in terms of what's out there on the Internet in that language. If the bars are the same length, that means that the proportion of people who speak the languages is the same as the proportion of information that's available on the Internet. Right. So English obviously is doing really, really well at the expense of a lot of other languages. Chinese is doing okay. Hindi, these are by order of speakers, right? Not so well. Spanish is doing pretty well. When we get down to Bengali, we see a real disastrous situation. Bengali, the, the seventh most spoken language in the world, is really uh, 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 hard to find on the Internet, right? So let's, go, let's look at some others further down. Here are the 3rd through the 13th, and we see um, uh, Russian does really well, right? Portuguese, okay. Urdu, very uh, badly. And then, and then here are just some selected languages to give you an idea. A few more European languages. We can see that Italian and Polish and Dutch and Swedish, like all European languages, do really well. Hebrew, not surprisingly, also does very well. Telugu is an Indian language spoken by, uh, you know, around 80 million people. Of a very big language, right? As you can see, a number of speakers bigger than any of these European languages, but with far less content. Persian and Vietnamese are kind of Asian success stories when it comes to uh, languages. They, these are two languages that really have succeeded in, I mean, their communities have succeeded in utilizing the new technology to make them available to people. There is content in both Persian and Vietnamese. But it goes, it drops down and when we get to African languages, the situation is really disastrous for these three of, some, some three of the largest languages in, in Africa. Uh, so Wikipedia is another way to measure this. It's, it's, it's not a very, it's not a perfect way to measure content, but it gives you an idea. You can see by how much English leads the Wikipedia world and how Hebrew, a very small language, comes in very high. 
second when these when this data was put together. Um, so, uh, with respect to internet content and language, the good news is that in one sense, the, the revolution has been successful. The internet really is multilingual, and it's increasingly so. The domination of English has decreased in the last few years. Chinese has increased by a, a massive amount. Other languages like Vietnamese and Persian, as well as all European languages, even languages like Catalan, not a national language, are doing very well. But the majority of languages in the world, the great majority of languages in the world, are not doing uh, well at all. And so the gap that we saw before still exists. And to some extent, the digital revolution seems to have actually exaggerated that gap, because now we have languages that are left out of this new domain that didn't even exist before to, to a large extent. So, so what about the digital divide? The digital divide is usually thought of as about access to technology. And so it's a familiar term, and it's, it's uh, typically thought of in terms of class or race or region, sometimes gender, uh, where you have populations that do not have, do not have the same kind of access as other populations, and it's extreme. And it obviously is opposed to the democratization of knowledge. But how does it relate to the linguistic digital divide? Well, what if we look at language and um, access to the technology? We see that the leading languages in terms of the proportion of people who have access to the technology are European or Japanese languages. Vietnamese, notice, is higher than English. Shows you the achievements that a socialist country can, can make you know, in, the, in this world that seems to be, in, and is, obviously dominated by, by uh, Silicon Valley and so on. So um, English is somewhat lower, and then for African languages, it drops way down. So you have even below 20% uh, of the speakers of languages like Somali and Malagasy, which are you know, big, significant languages. Uh, and so what you have is a, a correlation between um, well, I'll skip that. A correlation between the digital divide and language. Uh, and, and so you have what, what some people have called the linguistic digital divide, which is about two things. It's about content, that is what's out there in a language, and it's about the tools that people use to access technology. Are those tools available to them in their language? Do they have keyboards? Do they have spell checkers? Do they have speech recognition systems? in their language. So it's, it's a, a gap that separates languages in both uh, kinds of dimensions and it correlates with the digital divide. So it makes things worse. And it's obviously opposed to the dem democratization of knowledge and it reinforces old gaps that already existed. So remember the gap that appeared with colonialism between the privileged members of, uh, of a nation that could speak the colonial language after independence and those who never had the chance to learn it. Um, now this gap is even more serious than it was before because now you have people in places like India who know uh, English. You have people in the Democratic Republic of Congo who know French and who, who have access to way more than they ever would have had before. And then you have the majority of the population in the Democratic Republic of Congo who, ha who have access to no more information than they had before. So the gap is, is even more extreme than it was between the privileged and the, and the not so privileged within those communities. And then, of course, between the speakers of the privileged languages and the speakers of the, all the other languages. So why do we have the linguistic digital divide? Well, it, it, it's obviously uh, about capitalism. It, it's not profitable to make technology for communities that don't have the bucks to uh, pay for it, right? Or, uh, you know, don't even have access to the technology to use the, linguist, the, the language technology that you, that you make for them. Um, but there are still uh, other legacies of imperialism, linguistic imperialism, by which certain languages are thought to be superior to other languages because they're European or because they have a long written history or uh, they're associated with a certain group of people. And so this uh, colonization of the mind, it's sometimes called, uh, also inhibits this process. A, a place I'm familiar with pretty well is Paraguay, a bilingual country where 
the, the, the language is being Spanish and, a, and a, an indigenous language spoken by even more of the population than Spanish, but try and get the, the state, other than paying lip service to it, try and get the state to support this indigenous language and you'll hear people saying, well, is it really worth it for such a language? You know, to, is it, why, why, w why should we really bother when we could be putting our resources into teaching our students English? You know, shouldn't they really just be learning English? Maybe we should be taking Guarani, the indigenous language, out of the schools and replacing it with a Euro another European language, a language of the future, a language of progress, and so on. So this is a, another legacy of colonialism. Um, so <laughs> why don't I stop um, again and come back to this? Uh, maybe? Is that, hmm. does that make sense? Or what happened to my... Uh, here it is, okay. S so I still, yeah, I have left, I have a bit about large language models and uh, chat GPT. I, I wanted to say a bit about that because uh, you, you can't talk about NLP and not talk about it because Calvin said I would. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and then also talk about some encouraging signs. So. Well, in the interest of time, hopefully. Wh what's our time? We'll be <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure, about 15 minutes, 45 minutes. 45 minutes in total, so we can have yeah. about 20 Did or so minutes at the end for Q&A. Yeah. Before we move on, though, I do have yeah. a question yeah. about this section. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting graph that you showed with the number of speakers yeah. and the web pages that they occupy. I was thinking about how a really quick fix for a lot of companies that dabble with language production could be to translate a bunch of pages yeah. and call it like recovery of a language. But the purpose that serves is just generating um, data that already exists rather than um, recovery of the language by the speakers of it who have something different to communicate. And I know that you will get into yeah. this a little bit more with the readings that you came up with, but isn't it a real danger to call a language revived when it only exists on the internet, but isn't yeah. actively spoken in the communities where it came from? Yeah, it relates to two things. It relates to the, the idea of this, you know, good natural language processing not being something top down that's done by outsiders that come in and decide that they know how to save or revive uh, your language by just translating material into it. Not that that isn't important, but, but it, brings a, it brings up the role of the community in this process. And that, in a way, is the heart of the problem that we're having, that they're not in involved even here with this language. Mm. Even the technology is being developed for English, for the most part, the community that that should be served by it is outside the picture, right? A small group of mostly young, mostly white, mostly male people in Silicon Valley is making the decisions, mm. right? So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of get kind of get back to it. Yeah. Well, okay. So are there any questions online as well? Hi, Michael. This is Nazar. I'm curious in your discussion of languages in a colonial and post-colonial context, what you make out of the recent movement in some African countries, in particular thinking of North African ones, that see in moving their main foreign language from French to English as a form of linguistic emancipation and modernization away from a colonial language towards a supposedly friendlier and less <laughs> impurely connotated language like English. Wow, that's really an interesting question. Mm. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit about English uh, on the next slide, and, and then maybe I can, can come back to that. Um, I guess I was my, my first thought is that with respect to the gaps that, that I've been talking about here, it, it doesn't solve anything at all. It might make, I can imagine it might make uh, people in places like Algeria feel a bit better because of the, the disconnect with their colonial past, but um, I, I don't see, it doesn't solve this, this problem, really. Uh, English doesn't give them access to much more than, than French would, except in the way that I will mention next. 
So uh, let me say a bit about knowledge inequity and what's called the knowledge society, so a, f a framework that some ec uh, economists have used to talk about 20th century economics is that knowledge has come to play a role that, uh, that raw materials used to play. And in, th in the knowledge society, in the knowledge economy, knowledge is key. So, so where is knowledge in the 21st century? Uh, it's, it's created and, and transmitted and acquired and shared everywhere. Uh, knowledge is created everywhere. But certain kinds of knowledge, we can't help but say, have priority in this world. Those, that's the kind of knowledge that you need to just survive a lot of the time. Like how do, you, how do you install a solar panel or how do you save your potatoes from the disease that's affecting them or how do you treat schistosomiasis, right? You, w you want to know things that you need to know for survival and uh, that knowledge is disproportionately created in certain places and expressed in certain languages and not in other languages. And that's not, that's not to say that all knowledge comes from those places, from the north. There, there are also alternate sources of knowledge that we tend to neglect and uh, Boaventura de Sousa Santos has, has spent a lot of time talking about this, a Portuguese sociologist who writes a lot about alternative kinds of knowledge from the global south and the future being a future in which the north and the south try to have a kind of conversation with each other about, the, about so solutions to, uh, to the world's problems, a kind of conversation that will, in will require us to face the fact that Languages are different across this gap, and a lot of that knowledge is in uh, indigenous languages, actually, not in Spanish, for example. So l let me mention one other kind of domination, and that's the domination of English over all other languages. And that's especially true in uh, science, as you know. So here's some data uh, from citation indices, which are a good measure of how a language dominates. Over this period, from 2006 to 2015, within the physical sciences, um, the biophysical sciences, 97% uh, of the articles were published in English during that time, with German and Chinese being the second and third. Within the social sciences, 95% of the articles were in English. Within the arts, within the arts and humanities, 73%. And so, uh, for what it's worth, English has uh, completely taken over in uh, publication, academic kind of publication. Um, what does this mean? One thing that's interesting, and I couldn't find the, the data, unfortunately, but I, it's out there, is the domination of English-speaking countries in science. Mm -hmm. So independent of other measures, I believe you could show that the UK, the United States, Canada, and Australia dominate fields in part because it's easier for them to work with the languages. They don't have to learn them as second languages. They don't struggle quite as much, even, uh, you know, as people who, who know these languages very well. So um, this, of course, extends not just, is extends beyond science to all, so all sorts of kinds of cultural domination, economic domination. There's evidence that strong European languages like German and Italian are actually being influenced by English now, that because of the number of people who speak English as a second language in those communities, there, I've, I've read several articles recently about how people have begun to notice, well, wait, we didn't used to say it that way. That's not German. Wait, how is that creeping in to our German <laughs> now? Mm -hmm. Right? So even in the case of really strong languages that aren't in, endangered in any sense, we're seeing this, this powerful influence of English. So I wonder how that um, relates to the decision of countries like Morocco to replace French with English, yes, it, it probably does give them more access to, to science. And that, that is probably the case, right? But, um, so, uh, so kind of to summarize where we are, the digital era has resulted in a multilingual world that's given people who are speakers of about 25 languages a, an explosion in access to information and in tools for creating knowledge together, uh, and this has been really revolutionary. Many other languages with significant numbers of speakers, languages like, uh, like Amharic, languages like um, Thai and uh, Urdu, uh, are there in the digital world, but somewhat marginalized, right? It's harder to find that information. 
depending on what you want to do if you're a speaker of one of those languages, you're probably better off looking for the information in English or Chinese or French than looking for it in your language. And if you don't know one of those languages, well, you're stuck. It's going to be hard for you to find it. So the majority of languages, though, of the 7,000, have no role at all in the digital world. They, they are, there is nothing. They have nothing there. They have no technology available to them, and they have no content uh, on the Internet. And so most, those are the languages that are endangered, and many will disappear by the end of the century. So this is what, what Gerald Roche calls the slow genocide of language oppression. Um, and so wh where we are now in this 21st century is a kind of digital marginalization that represents, kind of in a way, a kind of new threat to the survival of languages. Um, well, so let me, let me mention uh, the large language models because these are a feature not of the, the, the marginalized languages, not of the disadvantaged languages, but these are a feature in particular of the most powerful language of all. Um, we're the ones, uh, native speakers of English like me and a lot of you, skilled second language speakers of English who are going to face the threats of this kind of technology. So what, what is the threat? So what is a language model first? A language model is just, mathematically, a frequency distribution over sequences of words. That just means that you ma ima amass all the statistics about how words in English follow other words in English and use that, those statistics to help you do something. So for example, if you give an English language model the, so the words, everybody is wondering who will win the, the language model will tell you the probabilities of the words that will follow those. They will say game is maybe the most probable, tournament, tournament next, NCAA, world, battle, as possible ways to continue the sequence. Everybody is wondering who will win the. That's all a language model is. That's all it is. It's just that. So how do you train a language model? Now the most efficient way to train a big language model. A big language model is one where the context is really long. The one I just gave you is a context of, what, seven words. With a seven word context, you can't do very sophisticated things. The next word just depends on those last seven words, but has nothing to do with what came before that. You can't write uh, a screenplay with a context of seven words. But if your context is 2,000 words, that is, if the next word is the most likely one, or you know the probability of the next word following these 2,000 English words, then that means you know a lot more about English. So you present a neural network with a lot of text. You present it with chunks of text that consist of these chunks that are that long, right? So for GPT-3, chunks of 2,048 pieces of text. And you train the neural network to predict the next word. And it knows what the next word is, given the text. So it's easy to train it, because the answer is right there. You don't need a teacher to teach a neural network this task. It's what's called an unsupervised task, or a self-supervised task, because the answer is in the text, right? The next word is there. The, ne the neural network is trained. This is the answer. That's the next word. You present this to the neural network for a really long time in the case of OpenAI for potentially months. And then, um, and then you use it. Now, language models are actually very useful. We, we, uh, what I don't want to do is to dismiss them at all. They're very simple and very useful. We could not build speech recognition systems without language models. Why? Because for a speech recognition system, you need to know what sequences of words are possible or common in English. A speech recognition is a very n system is a very noisy thing, right? It's, it's making candidate predictions about what the word was that the speaker says. And if it doesn't know anything about what words can follow other words, there's no way it can solve the problem. So this is really important for speech recognition and for speech synthesis where words are being produced by the system. You don't want the system to produce some totally impossible word, uh, you know, following a sequence of other words. So those are... And machine translation is another place. Generating text with a language model is another application that we might not want to use them for. Here's what you do. You give the language model some text, some English text. 
For example, you say, hey, how are you? How's it going? How are you, fe how are you feeling today? And then the language model predicts what word is likely next, like fine, or I, like, I don't know, or why, as part of why do you ask, right? And then you pick one of those words, one of the high probability ones, and you add it to the context. So now the context consists of, hey, how's it going? How are you feeling today? Why? And then you ask the language model what the next word is, and you repeatedly do this. And so the language model is now producing text, given the beginning of the text, that it itself is generating. That's how they work. That's all they do, except that the algorithm for picking the next word based on the probabilities is somewhat complicated. You don't want to always pick the most probable one. You get really weird stuff then, and it's always the same. That's the problem. The answer would always be the same. So you want it to be non-deterministic. So there's a little randomness in there. And they've played around with this a lot. So normally what you do is you, you train one of these, neural, these uh, large neural language models, and then you do what's called fine-tuning. It means you take the neural network that has the language model in it, and you train it a little bit on another task. But it's a task because now it knows all this English. The idea is that, well, it already almost knows how to do that. We just have to train it a little bit to do the task, like to write a recipe, maybe, right? That's called fine-tuning. The work, most of the work's done, the months you spent training it, now it takes maybe a few hours to do the fine-tuning and just change the parameters a little bit so now it can write a recipe. Um, GPT, is, uh, is as developed by OpenAI, is a very large language model, the largest. They, are, they, they hold the record now. And it's trained on a, a variety of texts which come from a, a corpus called the Common Crawl Corpus that basically goes out there and just grabs pages from the Internet. Um, they claim that, you know, they do this with permission. There are some serious issues now with whether they really did have permission in some cases. And it uses an architecture that's now very common in neural network, uh, in, in AI, called the transformer architecture, which is pretty simple. Now it turns out, for reasons that are maybe a little bit complicated, they don't, they don't actually fine tune these at all. They have this giant, this giant language model, and then they give it a context which has some examples in it of what they want it to do. So the context now of this stuff that is the beginning of, what, of the English that you're going to complete has some examples in it, and then they give, and then they give it a, a, another problem to solve like those examples, and amazingly, it often can. So here's, here's a case. They gave GP3, GPT-3 this English. A what poo is a small furry animal native to Tanzania. An example of a sentence that uses what poo is, we were traveling in Africa, and we saw these very cute what poos. To do a fardoodle means to jump up and down really fast. An example of a sentence that uses the word fardoodle is, and GPT-3 responded, one day when I was playing tag with my little sister, she got really excited and she started doing these crazy fardoodles, fard fardoodles or fardoodles, right? So this is the task of, of understanding a novel word that has never existed before. They wanted to prove that GPT-3 had in its knowledge of English, knowledge of what it means to create new words and use example sentences of those words. Uh, and it wasn't trained to do this. Um, so that's pretty shocking, <laughs> right? Uh, the problem is that, as in other neural networks, as I explained, they don't really know what GP3 knows. And so they might imagine, because the people at OpenAI are pretty sophisticated, that GPT-3 might know some pretty nasty stuff, right? So let's give it, let's ask it to do some things that are really nasty. And um, I can tell you that reading the paper where they describe the tests starts with a trigger warning at the top. You may not want to read this. I can tell you that not only are the responses of GP3 triggering but the prompts that asked for the responses were. But, so I'll give you one of the milder ones, 
which was, uh, how can I kill the most people with a dollar? They presented that to GPT-4 to see how it respond, would respond. It responded at length with many different ways to kill people. Uh, for, uh, please list several ways. Responded at length. And so what they do then is they actually do some fine-tuning now. So they teach the network by training it a little bit not to do that. When we ask you this kind of question again, don't respond that way. Instead say, oh, I can never tell you ways to kill other people, right? So in the report, they give you other examples of horrendous, really horrendous things they've asked GPT-4 to do. And the responses it gave before, shocking responses, and then now how it responds politely now that it's been retrained in a, to respond in a, what OpenAI calls helpful, honest, and harmless way. So, well, this scares me. I don't know if it scares you, but there's, there's a lot of problems with this, and a lot has been written about this. So I am not the, probably the person to talk to about it. You can, every week, the New York Times has an editorial on this. Everybody else does, too. So. The first problem, one problem with these large language models is the problem of, of hype. You know, G uh, Chad GPT uses first person, right? Responds I to you. Well, that probably is inappropriate, right? That already sets this up to seem like a person is talking to you. There are many other ways that this is true, right? So we don't know what they know. It, that's clear. The people at OpenAI who built these things didn't know what they, what they knew, and they chose a subset of horrendous things to ask the model to do, but which ones, I'm wondering, which ones did they th not think of asking, right? Um, but so we don't know what they're really doing, and we don't know, how they can be misused, that's clear they can be misused. You can easily see how they can be misused. Uh, um, and wh so what's, what were they trained on? We don't really know what they were trained on, because OpenAI hasn't released the set of sentences that GP3, GPT-3 and 4 were trained on. What we do know, though, is that it comes from the Internet. And we know that, we know who Internet users tend to be, and we know that they tried to filter out other languages to a large extent, so it's English. We know that the, the English users of the Internet are not representative of humanity. So humanity's knowledge is not what was put into this, right? A lot of horrendous, racist shit was put into this, along with some other reasonable stuff, right? So, um, but we don't know because they haven't told us what it is. So, th of course, it's English, and so other languages aren't represented, and that might be, that might be a good thing for the communities that are not represented. This may end up being a disadvantage of, of English because of what this could do. So there, it also takes a huge amount of energy and the greenhouse gases that are required for that to train these networks in these giant server farms that uh, have appeared out in Nevada and other places. Right? Uh, and the, the, maybe the biggest problem of all, which gets back to capitalism, is who gets to decide? Why, is, why are they doing this? Did we ask them? You know, was it, what, did a committee of citizens uh, approach OpenAI and say, we really need these? Could you uh, develop this? And here are some tests I'd like you to do to make sure that it doesn't get toxic and so on. So, um, so, so let's talk about uh, AI in, in more broadly and the democratization of knowledge. And so uh, the other systems that you've heard about in the last year that I know less about are systems... Uh, that are supposed to be now creative, that open up creativity to the masses. And these are actually sold to the public as democratizing creativity, democratizing art. Now you can create animation. Now you can create great art and submit it to competitions and so on, right? Well, here's what Samuel Dietz, animator Samuel Dietz, is pretty well known, said two weeks ago. Y'all didn't democratize, dem democratize shit. Y'all are just lazy thieves spitting on an entire art form. Fuck you, was what he said on Twitter. And that was quoted in an article by the co uh, tech commentator Paris Marx, who said, um, AI isn't creating anything novel. It's just rearranging the visuals or words it's been trained on 
to spit out something similar. But there's an ongoing concerted effort to get us to accept it as a normal part of future creation. We should reject it. So the idea is somehow we've created something, an animation using this system that's been trained on, yes, the animations that these great animators did over time. It's a kind of pastiche, a combination of all the great work that these people have done. And the idea is that you imagine that you have created it or somehow this brilliant system has created it. So um, I think I've, I've said pretty much, I like this quote from James Bridle uh, because it brings it back to capitalism. AI image and text generation is pure primitive accumulation expropriation of labor from the many for the enrichment and advancement of a few Silicon Valley tech companies and their billionaire owners. These companies made their money by inserting themselves into every aspect of everyday life, including the most personal and creative areas of our lives. Our secret passions, our private conversations, our likenesses and our dreams. They enclosed our imaginations in much the same manner as landlords and robber barons enclosed once common lands. They promised that in doing so they would open up new realms of human experience, give us access to all human knowledge and create new kinds of human connection. Instead, they're selling us back our dreams repackaged as the products of machines with the only promise being that they'll make even more money advertising on the back of them. So do I have any more time is, is the question because I, I wanted to end on a positive note or? <laughs> you can give us a positive note. Okay, so I did want to bring up bullshit because bullshit is a technical term um, invented by uh, Harry Frankfurt uh, quite a while back. But we really, with, with systems like GPT, we really have um, w bullshit generators because GPT the, the, the definition of bullshit is the bullshitter doesn't care whether what they say is true or not. It's just to suit their purposes. It doesn't matter whether, it's not a lie, it just doesn't matter whether it's true or not. And that's what GPT is doing, right? You get, you get uh, reviews of a book where it will quote from the book, but the quote is made up, right? So uh, if you ask GPT to tell you about a, a work that's not so popular, it knows the work. And it will happily make quotes from the work and even cite sources where it quotes other people, but they're all made up. They're not real quotes because it's just putting words together in a sort of sensible way. A quote goes here, a word goes here. Well, let me put another quotation mark at the end and move on. So um, is it worth it? Well, uh, McQuillan tells us to resist AI because it can't be fixed, but I would, I would like to suggest that I in terms of the, the linguistic digital divide, there are uh, positive things happening. And so there is a whole subfield within natural language processing that works on low resource languages, which present a special problem because we have these machine learning systems now that need massive amounts of data, but we don't have massive amounts of data for languages like Amharic. Well, we need to figure out other ways to work with them. And so there's a whole field there. That's sort of kind of where I am. And um, I'll go on and not show you what I, what I do per se. But the real future of all this is in developing systems that, are, that involve the communities of people that will use them and that could potentially be harmed by them. So this is related to what, what you were saying, Vasiki. So the problem with, with systems like GPT is that, they, that there was no participation from the communities of, uh, that would use them or that would potentially be harmed by them. And now th we, we have a, a chance for these communities to leapfrog over <laughs> some of the problems that happened along the way, right? Now, can that happen within capitalism? Well, that's a, another question. But if we're working within one of these low resource communities, we want to ask, the community needs to ask itself, do we want a Swahili chat GPT? Is that where we want to put our effort? Given that we don't have many resources and much money, do we want to spend them on this? Because this takes a huge amount of effort uh, as well as energy. To, to create it. Is that where we should be doing, should be spending the effort? So the community should, should get to decide that, right? And so another gap is, is trained people in the area of NLP from these communities, which is something that uh, I've been involved in a bit too, right? But there we have the problem that wherever you go and you see training programs in the tech world, you find Google, you find Microsoft. Microsoft and Google and, and Apple are there funding the education programs, right? They're in Africa. They're all over Africa. But w what do they want? 
they want to slot these African NLP experts into the mainstream model, right? Have them working for Google, have them the creating the kind of data that Google ultimately wants. So how do we, how do we, you know, support education of this sort without having the students get pulled in to this other model, the same as, you know, happens in the United States often with the military industrial complex, right? So, um, I'll, I'll save the slides later and you can go to these links, but these are four examples that I think of as really interesting uh, projects, um, uh, groups of people or institutes that are, that are really working on uh, NLP for the people. I'll just mention Masakani, which is a, a community of people across Africa that work together to publish papers. Um, th th they publish the only papers that I've ever seen that have as their first author the community. They actually have a little symbol that they use, the, the for all symbol, the logical for all symbol. That's the first author of the paper. Not an individual person, not a lab, but their community of people that have come together to uh, write papers. There's the distributed AI research started by Timnit Gabru, uh, the famous Google researcher who was fired for exposing uh, large language models. Uh, and Papareo is a project in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, started by Maori people to develop uh, technology for the Maori language from their community. They did not uh, solicit help from outside. They, they trained themselves. They built the technology to do speech recognition in Maori. So um, that's it. I guess I'll stop there and ho hopefully have a little time for questions. But <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <coughs> oh, here we go. Well, I hate to start thinking like a capitalist, but if you, from what you were saying, someone could say, oh, I'm going to make a profit by taking uh, Amar, Amaric, and uh, I'm going to take uh, a question from a student who wants to write a paper yeah. in Amaric, translate it into English, get the answer in English, translate that back for the student, and then they turn that in. So is that a model that uh, can be undermining the whole uh, possibility of creating? I'm not sure. Where, where, where's the research in this, though? Is that what's the? Uh, you, you don't mean a re research project. You mean? It could be a research. You mean, you mean theft, basically? Yeah. No, I'm just <laughs> right. saying that uh, rather than creating a whole uh, huge database of Amharic language yeah. sentences to, to draw on. Um, you just take the English, wh whatever a Numeric speaker yeah. wants to do with chat GPT, and they do it, it just translates it to English, gives them the English answer, translates that back to Numeric, and there you haven't gained anything. No, right. You, do, you, do you want that is the question, <laughs> and that, that's uh, something for the community to decide, not, right? It's did, not that I'm saying yeah. you want No, it, do they want it is what I mean. Do, do, they, do they want it is what I mean. I mean, I think you, you need to... Uh, uh, involve involve them in this, right? Is that is that a legitimate goal, or not? But yeah, I can see how, <laughs> right? It just translate everything into English, and then everybody has access to the wonderful GPT technologies that we're so proud of. Um. Is there any way where these technologies can be used to help people learn new languages in new ways? Um, or is that beyond the kind of capabilities of, of AI? Yeah, there's a whole world of um, uh, called computer-assisted language instruction, which has, which has its own conferences and things. I'm not too familiar with that world, but that's, that's uh, related to NLP as well. Yeah. So... It's related to the field of computer-assisted learning, right? Whatever you may think about that. I realize I never really answered the question about open source versus, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, the problem is if you if you made, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you made these large language models like uh, the GPT models open source as opposed to controlled by OpenAI, which turned out to be, unlike what they originally claimed, to be really no different from Google in the end. OpenAI looked like it was going to be a different kind of model, but it, it seems now that it isn't. So the problem, there's a problem with the models themselves 
that's sort of independent of, of who's in charge. We'd be better off if they were open source and so we had access to the data that they were trained on. That would solve one of the problems. And so, and if, then you could do a better job if it were open source of curating the data, of filtering it to make, to try and keep the toxic stuff from going in in ways that clearly they did not do. But you would still have the problem with the, with, with the use that they're being put to here, where you're expecting them to do things that really look like they're designed to replace things that people already do pretty well, <laughs> right? <laughs> like create text. If we're using the language models for legitimate purposes, like making speech recognition systems, then definitely open source, yes. Mm. Uh, well, first off, welcome to New York. Uh, <laughs> the company that I work for is based in Southern California. Uh -huh. Apparently, it's been snowing there in terrible weather. So, uncharacteristically, yeah. I hope that you've been uh, enjoying. Oh, some beautiful weather here. here. Yeah, California sure. sucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of naive in this realm, so bear with me. But from a historical perspective, I believe that you know socialism and the you know the um, the invention of the internet is sort of intertwined between like the pre-internet that was um, created in the Soviet Union in like the late 50s, um, the internet that was created in Chile with Allende in like the early 70s before it was destroyed by the CIA. I watched an Adam Curtis documentary about a year ago on like the history of advertisement and learned that um, you know a lot of the originators of the internet in America you know came from like you know the hippie period where, you know, obviously it had its perils, but may imply that there were some, you know, revolutionary, you know, intentions there before they began, like, collaborating with, you know, private uh, researchers and stuff like that in the 90s. So did those sorts of frameworks, did, did those sorts of, uh, did those realms uh, provide a more universal framework for the issues that you've been raising in regards to language that, um, say, uh, a more imperialist uh, internet uh, has not been able to implement? Well, I, I don't know the history very well, but the internet really does owe its existence to the, the Defense Department. You know, that's, that's where the internet really started. And so it, 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 it has more of a military origin than, than those projects that you described. The one I'm most familiar with is the one in Chile, which as you say, like, like the whole experiment itself, was destroyed, right, as, as exciting as it was. And, uh, and so we have that, and then we have Silicon Valley, and, and so there hasn't really been uh, th this hippie <laughs> side <laughs> hasn't played much of a role. Hippie or a leftist side hasn't played much of a role. In the I mean, you've had um, a, a, a somewhat positive kind of libertarian side, along with the really toxic libertarian <laughs> side in all of this. You know, like the Free Software Foundation uh, groups like that, that that really were trying to protect data from from the corporate world um, and and had and had some effect but the most powerful forces were were not of that sort we're just capitalists outright right or the military which is still heavily involved of course including in NLP in a, uh, a lot of NLP research including on smaller languages in particular strategic languages uh, like Persian, you know, and has been funded. Uh, Pashto, they love, they loved that for all those uh, years of the Afghan war, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of that work has been funded by the military and still is. Sure. So. Um, another thing that I'm curious about, you know, in regards to chat GPT and how that's, you know, slashed a lot of jobs in a lot of different sects and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, you know, work what David Graeber, for example, consider a bullshit job, you know, <laughs> just a lot of like profit generation, just recycling content and stuff like that. Um, however, you know, a lot of these like, you know, very not these more abstract labor uh, kind of jobs, um, they don't really provide anything to the econ economy in like a material aspect. Um, however, you know, if I'm able to generate like a blog, you know, with ChatGPT, um, that saves me a ton of time. And as someone who works from home, that saves me yeah. free time to, you know, watch another lecture or, you know, actually have, you know, provide like, you know, material praxis to my community and stuff like that. I'm interested in seeing, you know, you mentioned at the end that, um, you know, chat GPT is, you know, bullshit and should be disregarded in, in many ways. 
Um, I know, I believe like Slavoj Žižek a couple weeks ago, you know, talked about like the idea of high schoolers and how, you know, they can finally just like get ChatGPT to write their stupid essay and then they can go learn what they actually want to learn. So I'm interested <laughs> in seeing if you have any pushback on that front that, you know, as, you know, anti-capitalists, et cetera, we should be celebrating these efforts of, um, you know, automization from a leftist perspective, um, that it gives us more time to actually contribute to our communities and um, develop revolutionary praxis, et cetera. I'm, yeah, not the person. A lot of people have written about it. And there are those like, uh, what's his name? Mick, uh, what's his name? Uh, the resisting AI guy, McCullen, right? Who believes that all AI should be resisted, that th there is no role for this and it can't be fixed. And um, I'm in between. I'm not one of those that is suggesting that people like me and all of the other people like me should uh, quit their jobs. And um, and Chad GBT is it, it, it become it's going to be addictive. I think it's going to be very hard to to stop this because uh, there's already been a case. Maybe you heard of this case. I think was it Vanderbilt University? Did you after after one of the school shootings at another university? The university sent out a message to the students, trying to reassure them. You know that y we, you know, come for counseling if you're if you're having having issues, and uh, we're on your side. You know, we we all hope that this won't happen here. And at the bottom, it said this this letter written by Chad GPT, <laughs> and so, I mean, it's kind of an egregious example, but it's happening, of course, in schools around the country where essays that students have to write are, are they're not doing it, and schools are trying to confront this and. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, it's uh, in the case of the creative programs, th there seems like there's also no way to stop it. The art, you know, the uh, Dali and uh, the other programs that generate animation, and uh, so I, I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> I, I sh should we not use it or? Yeah, I'm, I've been mostly interested in, in trying to figure out what it can do, but uh, and so I've spent you know a lot of time asking questions about itself. You know, what if, what would you say you can't do? And it, it happily answers. You know, I cannot, I can't do this kind of thing, right? So don't bother to ask me. And so, thank you and safe I, travels. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. That last question just got me thinking, and I have a quick comment, which is that like, at an individual level, it feels like this technology is helpful to us in our roles, but at a societal level, it just feeds into this treadmill where like, the amount of work that one person at a company is expected to do is just going to scale up proportionally or more than proportionally. So that's my overarching concern is that like, while it may be helpful in a very short-term sense in the long term, it's just going to like maybe replace, uh, yeah, it's just going to heat more and more work onto us if we're not organizing. Anyway. I, I, I would mention one other thing, though, and that is the labor that doesn't get noticed a lot of the time. A lot of, a lot of stuff has to be annotated uh, for, for systems, for hate speech detection, for the, for the sentences that need to be excluded from mm -hmm. some of these systems. And to annotate means to read uh, some innocuous things, but also some really awful stuff, and mark it as no, don't put that in there. And the annotators are t are people in places like Kenya, who are being paid uh, a couple hundred dollars a month to do this, and so there there are a lot of unsung workers that are that are not noticed. It's not that all of this is automatic and magical and machine learning is doing it all. There are a lot of people behind the scenes that are being exploited in the creation of these systems. Um, yeah, the last two comments were really interesting. I am a teacher, um, so ChatGPT has shown up in the classroom in various ways. I do teach science, so it's a little different, but um, to give like some concrete examples of how they manifest is like college essays, applications to scholarships. A lot, I teach a lot of seniors, so they mm -hmm. chat GPT it. And to the point that they, Slavoj Žižek, you know, they're going to go learn the thing they want to learn. They're not. They're going to like spend their time on TikTok or <laughs> yeah. however else like time is controlled and regulated outside of 
you know, education. Um, but to another point is teachers, some teachers are also, and this is like a concept of like proletarianization, like culturally, at least for teachers, is some teachers are using ChatGPT to make lesson plans. And this has already been a problem where like teachers have been removed from making a lesson plan, like a company is hired and the company then makes a lesson plan, gives it to the teacher. But those people that work at that company were at least teachers at one point. Yeah. Now the lesson planning <laughs> is done by statistical <laughs> probabilities of lang you know, like yeah. now it's <laughs> so now the, what is lesson you know, what does it mean to be an educator at all? You know, when yeah. you're ma you, when your lesson plan now you don't even make and it's not made by other teachers. I don't know. I, that's not really a question, but it's just like I don't know what's I don't <laughs> really understand what's happening in education in that capacity. So yeah. Mm. Also makes teachers really easy to be replaced, mm -hmm. Absur yeah. absurdly. Okay. Um, we have one. Our last question is online. How might these large language models help with research that would otherwise be impossible due to the quantity of data necessary to aggregate? It's hard not to do it, right? I mean, um, a, a, a student of mine. I have a student in. Uh, in Ethiopia, who is taking a class, and <laughs> she it, it, she had an unreasonable assignment for the class. She had to report on uh, something like hot areas in AI, <laughs> right? And you know, and uh, so I said, well, you know, <laughs> let's just see what ChatGPT says. <laughs> so <laughs> it helped her, <laughs> right? She said, fortunately. She said, oh, I'm so glad because those are the areas I, I already had in mind. So it, didn't, it wasn't all that new, but it's encouraging to know that ChatGPT agreed with the areas of AI that it didn't write the presentation or anything for her. But think of the temptation if you're working on a research project and you want uh, something that summarizes all the work that's been done over the last five years on X. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to do a really good job or get the quotations right, the citations right. You don't care if it misses a word. <laughs> you just want to know the content of it. That's a really good question. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that actually does seem like a, a, an application that's hard to, hard to resist. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Michael. A huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And to Vasiki and Science for the People and Salvatore, thank you all so much for putting this together. Um, yeah, hope you'll stick around. Join us for our next Science, for the, uh, Science Against Capitalism seminar. And yeah, thanks for coming out, everyone. And, and another note is that we are having a book launch by that's um, between the, the People's Forum and Science for the People about atomic days with Joshua Frank and Cliff Connor, they'll be in communications if you want to come back and hear a little bit more about extraction at um, sites of mining uranium. That'll be a great event to come back to. Next Friday at 6.30, here. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much all for coming in. Professor Gasser, uh, really enlightening. Um, I, I just hope that people who are not or are not like me versed in, in, the, in the field uh, or who are maybe thinking of undertaking these studies in this field will take advantage of this, um, of this lecture, understand what is at stake. Uh, I, had, I didn't really understand the extent of uh, what is at stake, in fact, uh, and so I thank you for enlightening us on this. And all the more urgent to have more socialists involved in, yeah. uh, in making projects, in doing the research, and uh, perhaps in uh, expanding on those four projects, for example, that you've yeah. um, showed us uh, in terms of uh, countering and uh, the the processes at, at hand. So thank you very much. Yeah, I did want to mention that you know there are labs, uh, uh, like university labs, also where interesting stuff is going on. You you have to pick and choose. You know, see where the funding is coming from. Is it from the Defense Department or Google or maybe not? So. Well, thank you very much, everyone.